Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Please, everybody have a chair. Uh, there, we'll continue to have the refreshments outside. They'll be available all afternoon. But we do want to begin. We want to say thank you to all of you for coming. Uh, delighted to have you here. My name is John Hamry. Uh, I'm the president at, here at CSIS. We are delighted to be partnering with the Williamsburg uh, Foundation on this forum. Uh, let me just say a, a word of background on how this has happened. Um, uh, Colin Campbell, a very, very good friend, and he, uh, we were talking about nine months ago, and his, he's a very deeply optimistic man about the world, and said that he wanted to use the, the, the inspirational power drunk from the Nile. I, I don't think I got sick from it, but I keep coming back. Some people say that is a sickness. Um, but no, but Egypt is, it's good. So Egypt is, uh, is near and dear to my heart. It's a great pleasure to be on this panel um, with a number of people who I either know by, uh, I know personally some, I know some by reputation. It really is a, a wonderful representation of the variety of Egypt and some of the talent in Egypt, starting uh, from your extreme right, my extreme left, we have uh, Mustafa Al Hassan, who's the founder, chairman, and CEO of GCC Global Consolidated Contractors. Before he, that company was established, he served as the business development representative in London. Uh, he was in the public relations business. He was an event organizer. He's an international business developer. Uh, he opened an office in.
professor at the American University in Cairo. She was the deputy secretary general of the Constituent Assembly drafting the Constitution. She not only has been a, a commentator on the political development of post-revolutionary Egypt, but I think she has been an incisive analyst, really a thought leader, as people try to understand both what this means and where it's going, and we're delighted to have you on the panel as well. What I thought we'd do to start off this first panel on the new Egypt is to have each of my to my left with Khalid, and then we'll move to Mr. Suwiris and we'll bounce back and forth. And, and what I'd like to do is to keep this relatively short and to really create a, 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 an open dialogue, first among us and then among the audience, rather than have a lot of set piece presentations. So you got wave. <laughs> Oh, so you start with this one? I start with, you don't even, you don't, <laughs> these guys don't even get the green one to start. We start with the yellow and we go from there. That's putting me under the gun, but I'll try to be very quick. Uh, I, I think I'm happy to represent the new Egypt. Uh, the new Egypt is uh, Egypt of the youth. That's the new Egypt to me. It's not Egypt of the politicians, it's not Egypt of the quarrels that we're living. Same way you guys here in the U.S. have the quarrel in Washington and the innovation in the Bay Area driving your economy every day and every morning, I would like to see that happening immediately in Egypt because the, the political quarrel is important and will that has been evolving in the new Egypt uh, after the revolution is that of the youth and uh, particularly driving entrepreneurship in this country. Uh, it's amazing because I lived a long time to see the people in the country and the difference in behavior towards entrepreneurship before and after the revolution. There are lots of youth who went to Tahrir Square despite their parents. Their parents would say, don't go, this is dangerous. You know, they would still go. And that was a mindset change. The same thing would apply if they told their parents, and I have a case like that, third year student, Tanta University, went to his mother and said, I'm not continuing my studies. I have this great idea of building a company that will recycle electronic waste. And I invested in this guy, I invested in, in seven others, but that guy would never have had the acceptance of his parents, of the community, to do what he did before the revolution. After the revolution, people is accepting those youth, and they are not even waiting for acceptance, they are driving their own agenda. And I think the new Egypt will be driven by the youth who have been deprived of uh, empowerment uh, throughout the 60 years that we've lived, has nothing to do with just Mubarak era. Throughout uh, uh, um, the years, we have not empowered the youth enough. And to me, that's a really very important um, change we're seeing. Now, because there is a quarrel, I would like to tell you that I've invested so far, I've built an angel investment fund, and I've met with over 200 of about 3,000 startups that uh, came after the revolution. And the seven I invested in, and this is statistics, three are ladies, four are men as entrepreneurs. That's the right statistics. I didn't mean to make it, I didn't put quotas, it just happened to be three were ladies, four were men. One belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood, one is pro-Muslim Brotherhood but doesn't belong to them, one is a Christian. Again, if you look at that sample that just happened by sheer coincidence, this is a great sample of uh, the Egyptian fabric. That's where we are today. These are the constituents of this society. 
And when they go to entrepreneurship, when, they, when I gather them once a month to talk to each other and help each other, it all transcends politics, ideology, and all of that, and they are all thinking money. Let's make money, let's create wealth, let's make Egypt you know, a very successful country based on our very good ideas that we can uh, serve the communities with and so on. The last point, I see the red card starting to get closer, is what's the role of the US? And the US for a long time has been supporting governments, states. And a lot of money that has gone in supporting government and states has not paid off, either because of corruption, because of abuse, because of not targeting the right uh, customers or, uh, or clientele, and so on. I think it's about time for a big chunk of the U.S. attention, not just in Egypt, but in the entire Middle East, to go towards the youth, towards entrepreneurs. And that's the way that will bring people together. That's the way that will drive the economy. And let Egyptians settle their own political quarrels the way they would like. Thank you. Actually, I'm a businessman uh, who became a politician by force. It was not my wish, you know. And I, I am sure I make a very bad politician because I'm not very diplomatic, you know. The, the new Egypt is nothing uh, but the old Egypt. Uh, nothing has changed. So we did a revolution to, uh, uh, to acquire a new freedom of rights, freedom of speech, real democracy, women rights, minority rights. Uh, a real democratic process, and I can't in good faith, being an honest person, say that we have that today. So uh, the bad news is that uh, there is no uh, new Egypt right now. Uh, we are in the same situation when it comes to freedom of speech. The media is under pressure. Uh, the opposition is being targeted and is not uh, uh, safe to be in, uh, in an opposition. Uh, uh, the governing body doesn't want to govern democratically. So uh, there is no new Egypt, you know. I mean, uh, I agree. I mean, we all participated in the revolution thinking we will achieve a new Egypt, you know. I, I cannot tell you how, what kind of spirit was in Tahrir Square in January uh, 2010, was it? 11, 2011. I mean, it was like a a joy, you know, people were singing, playing guitars, the young people, uh, as, as my colleague here said, nobody listened to his parents, including me, you know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I made a, I just made a speech now where I told, I started by telling them what happened when I was on a TV show in January, three days after the revolution, and Mr. Mubarak was still in charge, and his Minister of Interior, and the whole old fear of the system was still in place, you know, and then the uh, broadcaster asked me, okay, you, I was trying to be diplomatic against my nature and try also to save us. So I was saying, okay, let's just move on and forget about the revenge from Mubarak and the regime. We want to build the new Egypt and so on. So my, which I called diplomatically, you know, at that time. And then the anchor, he was very smart. He put me under the gun. He said, um, Okay, all what you're saying is good, but are you for the revolution or against the revolution? Are you telling the people in Tahrir, are you with the people in Tahrir or not? So usually I answer very fast, and, but at this time I took a second because it was very dangerous. And then I said, no, I'm with the people in Tahrir. They should not move from there until we get all the things we're fighting for. And then I went down, and the first call I got was from my dad. And my dad told me, what the heck are you thinking? <laughs> What did you just do now? And can you please explain to me what you just did now? Because you had all the pressure of the old regime. And I told him I just did what was right. It was the right thing to do. Nothing more. I didn't think much about it. It was the right thing to do. And I share, I am with these people and so on. I mean, if Mubarak could have stayed, I would, most probably I would be now in Torah instead of Amir. <laughs> but uh, uh, I wish I would be the optimist. Uh, you know, but I, can, and I, I don't want to lie against my conscience. I mean, as I said, uh, uh, the only way out of the deadlock we're having now is for, for each party to reach to each other, sit down, and see how we get out of this deadlock. Because the, the attempt to try and rule with your friends and alone, people who don't belong to you, and ignore them completely, uh, is not going to work. 
They're, the young people of Egypt have not died yet. They're still fighting. They're on the streets, and they will not give up until they feel that the revolution they lost their friends for, uh, eyes and murder, and, and uh, has gained what we really fought for. It was not a, re a religious revolution. It was not about religion, you know, because all the Egyptians are believe in God and are religious. You know. It was about freedom and justice you know, that we haven't obtained yet. You know. the, the positive part of that story is one never outgrows one's parents enjoying watching them on television. <laughs> so that, that's comforting. Mustafa. John. Thank you for giving me the chance to present myself and as I pledge myself as a normal Egyptian businessman, entrepreneur, does not belong to any parties. I didn't vote. I didn't want to vote. I didn't know what to do at the time where uh, total chaos, nobody understand anything. And uh, to be honest, I returned to Egypt from 2005 and uh, decided to work outside of Egypt as I tried to work in Egypt itself and I crossed with the previous regime badly, so I decided to use Egypt to work in other neighboring countries like Iraq and Libya and Qatar, which was a very successful story because uh, Egypt is full of resources. But then after the revolution, I decided to have my own revolution, where uh, how do I see Egypt? My friends went to Tahrir. I had friends all over. I had friends in Libya. We had 25,000 labor in Libya. We had to evacuate them. So we had so much work to do at the time. But I decided to do my own revolution to understand what's going on. I understand after reading and reading that's not only Egypt. It is the Middle East. It is Syria. It is Libya. It is Gaza. It is Israel. It is the whole region is changing. It's not only Egypt. And the change wave is coming. It's impossible to stop it, whether it's Mubarak regime or any regime, it is coming uh, no way. I give the, uh, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the big thanks to the youth of Egypt who leaded the revolution, but it was on, not only the youth of the uh, Egyptian who deleted the revolution. There was a big need for the revolution to happen, and all the big brains of Egypt, the military, and uh, whoever decide Egypt's future was aware of this revolution eight months ago, before the revolution. It didn't come by accident. It was planned, and it happened. And when the Egyptian people went down to the street, everything started to fall down automatically. For the past two years, we decided as a group to look at the real problem of the streets of Egypt. We pulled out all our engineers from all over, our sites, we focused in Egypt in a capacity of 200 engineers studying the best economic reforms for Egypt for free, for whoever party is winning. We worked first for the military, then we started to work for the Freedom and Justice Party, and then we started to present our ideas to the presidential level, and it's going, and I see there's some progress, it's happening. Maybe it's not in the media, Maybe there is no enough media about the positive view about Egypt, which is, I blame the media for this big time. But there are many, uh, legal, uh, 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 many uh, economic reforms, steps has been taken every ministry. I see, I'm very optimistic, extremely optimistic about the future of Egypt, as we are too close to each ministry and the reforms of each ministry is happening. First phase, President Morsi took the power from eight months ago, or nine months ago. He elected the prime minister, and the prime minister elected ministers. And then every minister took his position reviewing the current ministry of corruption problems. And uh, I agree that the corruption was too deep up to the small employees who received 500 or 1,000 Egyptian pound salary. So it's a tree of corruption. And to manage a country with these corruption uh, 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 problems, it's very difficult. So every minister decided to run a full inspection in his ministry and to find the best way of how to correct this corruption. Of course, the ex-regime did fight against this big time, until now. 
and the uh, whatever the freedom and justice or whoever will take the power as a, uh, a political party will face the same problem. If you're really looking to establish a new system of clarity and transparency, you will face problems with the old regime uh, uh, network. And this is what we faced so far. So I really don't blame so much what's going on into the streets of Egypt now. It is a, a new wave of transaction to the better future. We are too close to understand that there are many uh, good things that are happening. And I really look forward for the oppositions to participate, even if the Muslim Brotherhood stop them. They have to force their participation by a strong economical model. They have to publish it. I'm sorry, the red card is here. So, <laughs> so I'll leave. Thank you very much, Bernard. Uh, Thank you, John. Um, I really think that the, uh, um, the new Egypt is yet to emerge. It's not there yet. And I do not see or think of uh, Egypt today as post-revolutionary. I think of Egypt today as still in a revolutionary state. And what happened was that the 18 days that toppled Mubarak was simply the beginning. And I think um, that it was a revolt against um, uh, not just the corruption and the brutality of that regime uh, uh, and the undermining of, uh, of the whole um, society and the different institutions, but it was also a revolt against the um, colossal failure on, on all uh, different levels. And now it's the building of Egypt, and I think that there is a potential uh, for a democratic Egypt, and democracy um, uh, everywhere is faulty, including the American democracy. And how about then if it's a transition to democracy? Yesterday we had uh, Professor um, Gordon Wood of um, uh, Brown University who actually um, told us how messy it was after the American Revolution for years. And I think that that is a, an important uh, lesson for us Egyptians to, to keep in mind. Um, in my view, uh, there is a lot of work for us Egyptians to work on, and uh, the way I see it is that it's an ongoing struggle. Democracy is not a place where you reach and, and then um, we're celebrating that we're in a democracy. It's an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing struggle in Egypt to reach um, our uh, dream of having a democratic future. It's, our, uh, it's an ongoing struggle for women in Egypt to have equal rights, just as it is in the United States where women now are still fighting for fair uh, pay. And um, also, um, what I would say, uh, the relationship between religion and state is also an issue everywhere in the world. I think that the Egyptian democracy is going to have its own coloration and um, it is going to be an Egyptian coloration. It's, we're not, Egypt is not Pakistan, Egypt is not Turkey, Egypt is Egypt. And as much as um, uh, in the United States uh, there is a, um, a separation between state and religion, there is a very close relationship between uh, religion and politics in the United States. And I think that the American experience, which is very different than the uh, European experience, is much closer to the Egyptian experience, where I think that Islam is going to have um, a, a role in the Egyptian democratic experience. Now, it's, it's up to us in Egypt to figure out the relationship between uh, religion and state, and I have been calling on my different colleagues uh, who are politicians, and I'm not, I'm, de I'm independent, to face up to this important responsibility and start the dialogue, start the dialogue in order to reach a national consensus on what should be the relationship between religion and state in Egypt. 
Thank you very much. I thought maybe we would start where, where you, you talked about, well, the, re the revolution's ongoing. Um, Chu Enlai in, in China reportedly, perhaps apocryphally said when asked about what he thought of the American Revolution in the mid-1970s, it's too early to tell. When do you think we will really be able to judge this? I mean, Mr. Suwiris said there hasn't been a revolution yet. Mosfar al-Hassan said, there's been a revolution, it's, it's going well. Khalid said there's been a, a revolution in people's minds and there's no going back. When do you think we'll be able to reach some consensus both on what has happened and whether it is a positive development for the Egyptian nation or a step backward? Why don't we start with Mr. Suides? I think uh, it will only happen when the uh, governing body understands that their attempt to uh, what we call in Egypt, we use the term akhwana, or to, to uh, make all the, uh, the key power points in the ruling mechanism of Egypt in their hands will fail. Because the Egyptians want equality, and the first rule of this equality that you just don't put your friends and family in positions so you can control the rest of the people. You know? So it will not happen, and we will not see the real, a real democracy until they understand that this is a country for everyone, from uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhoods and the non-members of the Muslim Brotherhoods, for the Muslims and the Christians, because when you talk about religion, you need to talk about Christianity too, because there are 12 million Christians in Egypt. Uh, so uh, it's only when they will realize, right now, it's very clear that they're still attempting to go their way and not listen to any opposition, uh, 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 and not listen to the requirements of the opposition that we want a level playing field. Once they do that, once they f finally understand that this is not gonna work, and they reach out for the opposition, so we can build this country together and, and, and make sure that everybody lives it it's safe and we have an independent uh, uh, juridical system, the judges are safe, we are safe as opposition, the businessmen are safe, the private sector is safe, then we will see uh, a real uh, uh, progress. So, so if I could just boil down, it's about the institutionalization of democracy rather than the holding of elections. And by institutionalization of democracy, it's the, 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 the ability of all to compete and the ability of all to share an authority. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mustafa Hassan, you, you, you suggested that some of that's already happened. Is, is that, do you, do you think there, we can judge this revolution a success, a success yet or is the jury still out? When will we know? Well, clearly, I can tell you that there is one party is moving forward and one party is criticizing. We need the two parties to move forward. When I decided to go for, to help with my technical engineers, I only found one party has a clear direction with a clear uh, uh, economical model. Maybe it's an idea need to be built on, and we decided to help them and go ahead. I didn't see any other ideas. I didn't see any other uh, uh, section of the ideas. So I think what's going on now, that uh, the first party is taking the lead for the economic revolution, and the results will come very soon. The whole country is turning to a system where the minister will be only an employee. He's no longer important, man. He's running a system where he's sharing the wealth with all the people. So there is no hassle of who is going to be the minister. The system is changing. The public-private partnership and the BOT concept and turning almost 50% of the GDP income to a public-private partnership uh, projects will make the Egyptian economy 
more open to private sector to, uh, to uh, uh, participate in. From, there, from that perspective, th there is no need for fighting for government. The governments are going to be only on employees, and there is no need for fighting together. There is a need to work together. There is a need to have a parallel economic program made by the opposition competing with the current one or correcting it. We don't see that as businessmen. How have we seen the, the rise of a post-political Egypt? Uh, I repeat, I'm not a politician. And uh, politics is, uh, is always an opinion. But I'm surprised to see the economy being an opinion. And the economy uh, is obvious. I, 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 I sorry, if, but I fully disagree with Mustafa's assessment. The economy is, is draining. The economy is, is falling apart. The numbers say that. It's not what I wish it was. I, I hope you were right. I'm very unhappy that I'm saying that. But the economy are numbers. There is a current account deficit. There is uh, um, an energy bill that we are unable to pay. There is drainage every day. And it, it, if the IMF loan uh, is postponed further, which it seems that it's not done yet, uh, we will be in deep trouble much sooner than we can fix the political quarrel. So the jury is out because I, I'm not optimistic about the political quarrel anymore after being here for three days because I've been listening to both parties and I'm very apartial. I'm not with one or the other. But after listening to both, I discovered and realized how far apart they are and that I don't see much reconciliation at this stage. So my only hope now is to isolate that quarrel from the burning fire of the economy, try to find a quick remedy and solution, and then maybe the revolution uh, uh, will be called partially successful. If we fall apart as an economy, then obviously, I, I, I will not be the one judging, neither will be any of my colleagues here. It's going to be the people in the street judging the success or failure of this economy uh, by virtue of uh, not being able to eat, drink, and have electricity. Very, very basic things. So that would be very unfortunate. So not to ask a, a Washington question, but where does Washington fit into that analysis? I mean, you you'd said Washington should be encouraging entrepreneurship, working less with governments, more with people. Um, there is a requirement that the State Department deal with states, that we have a relationship with Egypt. The fact is we have a $1.3 billion a year military relationship with the government of Egypt, with the armed forces of Egypt. As we think through this analysis, as we talk about the nature of the politics in Egypt, as we talk about the human capital investments that we need to be made and need, and need to flourish, what should the United States be thinking about doing that it's not doing? What should the United States stop doing that's actually counterproductive? And not why don't you start? Well, I didn't have a chance to respond to the other question, but uh, just as uh, Mr. Sawiris said, um, uh, talked about the uh, uh, Christians in Egypt, that is exactly what I meant by uh, Egyptian forces would um, face up to the reality that this is the core issue that Egyptians have not built a consensus on. And we are actually moving in vicious circles because we're talking about details in Egypt, like, you know, the election law or, you know, what's going on with the Islamic bonds. That's not the issue. The issue really, which is creating the lack of trust among the political forces in Egypt, is that they do not trust each other on the issue of state and religion. And unless this issue is solved, and everybody has to compromise on it, um, you know, the, um, the, um, um, the, uh, the Muslim brothers uh, are not leaving and the liberals are not leaving and the, we all have to um, work together 
um, we have to, we are Muslims and Christians, liberals, uh, leftists, and uh, Islamists, and this issue has to be solved according to all these, um, to accommodate everyone. Uh, when it comes to Washington, I think that what I just said is, um, is linked to uh, the role of Washington. I think Egyptians have not had a consensus about core issues. And because of that, it's my advice to Washington is to stay away from Egyptian domestic politics because this is the issue that Egyptians have to figure out uh, themselves. I would just here make um, or give two examples because Washington is damned if it does, it, it's damned if it doesn't. Um, when uh, President uh, Obama uh, said, made a statement saying Egypt is not a foe nor a, an ally, um, there were people who were complaining that the United States is now, um, uh, you know, shifting its position. When Kerry was in Cairo, uh, people were complaining that the United States is taking sides. So each side of the Egyptian polarization is actually accusing the United States of being uh, siding with the other. And the word accusation I'm using deliberately because it is an accusation. It's used to discredit the other side. And because of that, um, it, it seems to me, and I appreciate American pragmatism and the pragmatic um, uh, philosophy is, is, is very American. And I appreciate that the United States is going to um, work with whoever the people vote for. In, in in Egypt, full stop. And, you know, um, the, the most dangerous, I think, in the relationship between Egypt and Washington is for Washington to take sides in the Egyptian polarization. Thank you. Well, I, uh, it's nice when uh, civil or liberals disagree, because <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this is what everybody is saying, you guys are all uh, fractioned and you disagree. No. So, <laughs> Personally, I don't think the United States can afford not to uh, interfere in Egypt. And uh, that's maybe the excuse why they have interfered and everybody in Egypt believes that they have sided with the Muslim Brotherhoods from the beginning and t till, till even till now. So, because Egypt must succeed, you know, there is no, uh, I mean, we don't have the luxury of leaving Egypt to fail. Because Egypt is not just any Arab country. If Egypt falls, the whole region will go down the drain. So. None of us here, opposition or Muslim brotherhoods can, and or nor America can afford to let Egypt go. So to, to think that America cannot, must not interfere, it's just too idealistic and will not happen. But what we're telling them is, you, you guys here, you live in a country, you have an excellent constitution, black, white, uh, Hispanic, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, all have the same rights. You don't have the churches burning. You don't have uh, uh, Muslims being killed. You know, because you don't have any of these issues. You have free press. You have the Senate and the Congress. You have Democrats and Republicans. You live under the rule of law. Your juridical system is completely independent. So do you think that this is luxury? We can't have this? So what we're saying is, for America, engage, engage with the Muslim Brotherhoods, support Egypt. We have no problem with that. But one, one request is, if you do that, just remind whoever is governing that we Egyptians will not accept any turning back to a dictatorship or a fascistic regime or a regime that attacks the juridical system, neglects the rule of law and order, refuses to have transparent and, and, and fair elections under international supervision, refuses to listen to, to, to the uh, opposition. Uh, you know, so, so it's not like we're telling the, the Americans, if they want to engage, they should engage under, their, under the same rules they have. Because they've tried it in the 50s and the 60s when they sided with dictators, when they sided with fascistic regimes. And where did this take us? Nowhere. So we're living now in the 20th century, Perhaps. and we're 21st, 21st century, <laughs> and, and we don't want to live in the 20th century. Good. <laughs>
How is that the right plane for, for American engagement? Uh, again, in, in, in my humble interpretation, uh, the U.S. has been always looking for the Holy Grail, which is a regime in the Middle East that is popular, but yet fully aligned with American standards and policies. And since Nasser, that didn't happen. Either they were popular or they were aligned with the U.S. They could not achieve so far this dream of finding somebody who can do it. There may have been hope that the Muslim Brotherhood is that you know, popular yet aligned ally. Uh, I don't think popular has become uh, something that at least the street agrees upon. They have some support, but popularity is, is fading at least, the least to say. So what can the U.S. do now when it failed yet again after the fourth regime to find that popular aligned regime? Uh, two things I've noticed, and let me tell you a very, very quick story, because after my PhD from MIT, I lived about 10 years, started company CEO, thought that, that, that I knew it all, and, and, and I went to take a course at Wharton, and we had two days on negotiation skills, and I discovered how wrong I was for 10 years with all my skills of negotiation and all what I tried to do that I knew nothing about negotiation. This was an eye-opener to me. In two days, it changed my life until this very day. And what I saw, both parties, is lack of negotiation skills. Negotiation is, a, is, is not just a talent. It's not just uh, showing your muscles and showing your power. It's not being stubborn. Negotiation is a skill and something you can learn. We had about seven case studies in two days, and we had to work very hard to solve these cases uh, on negotiation skills. I urge all parties to go and take negotiation skills. The U.S. may prepare a course like that. This sounds silly and naive, but sorry. I mean, this can seriously help. If it doesn't, or at least doesn't accomplish the full thing, let me give you another thing the U.S. did very well, Camp David. How much quarrel was there between Egypt and Israel before Camp David? This was a battle, right? And it was solved in a few days. Sadat on one side, Begin on the other side, and Carter chartering between the two until he fixed the negotiation skills problem, and they converged. Do we have a bigger quarrel today between one party and the other? Definitely not. At least we're all Egyptians, and we all want one thing. So maybe the U.S. can play that role. Maybe the U.S. can bring five from this side, five from that side, put them in Camp David for two weeks, and solve the problem. I'm serious. I mean, I don't, I, I, wherever we're going today is really serious. It's really bad. If, if people are not feeling the urge, I am, and I'm not a politician. So I hope the U.S. takes one of these actions or both. Three, three days at Williamsburg clearly wasn't what the doctor ordered. <laughs> Mustafa. Yeah. I believe, I agree with all the views that my colleagues has uh, explained, despite the fact that the U.S. should interfere between the Egyptians themselves. I really disagree with this because every country has its own DNA, and only the people in the country understand what they want and what do they heading for. The Egyptian people, by nature, are peaceful. My uh, neighbors are Christians. My good friends are Salafis. My ex-girlfriend, I'm sorry, I'm married now, <laughs> and she was Christian. So can you imagine? Uh, we are normal people. We never had fights together before. We never saw churches burning or Muslim brotherhoods are dying and fighting like that. So this is all made up by the revolution problems. And uh, sometimes if you investigate more, you will find money bef behind it and and targets and other stuff. So it is not going to shape the Egyptian people at the end of the day. But I agree the U.S. should interfere in one thing, which is the update of Camp David. And uh, Camp David is now 30 years old, which is uh, things had changed in the whole world. Powers had changed completely. The game is different. 
there is, must be an update. We want to develop Sina. What's going on with Israel? We want to have develop Swiss Canal. What's going on with the global security issues? Where are the American part in, in, in this development? The threats and, and the risk around the Middle East. This is a big part where the US should play immediately because it's going to shape the politics of the Middle East. Thank you. Opening negotiations presumably also would mean opening negotiations over the Nile waters. I think that would be, that would be enough negotiation to fill all of, uh, all of Khaled's uh, courses for some time to come. Before we go to the audience, I have a, a, few, more, a few more issues I want to, to talk about. Um, you know, one is uh, the issue of, of parties other than the United States. So we have a bilateral relationship with Egypt. We are constrained by our laws. We have a role in Egyptian politics, as people have thought about the United States, often unpopularly supporting uh, the, the, the previous government. Is there a way to think about solutions to the current problems in Egypt where the United States would not be doing it bilaterally, would not be doing it primarily, but the U.S. would be supporting a broader effort, or there would be an effort that others would coordinate? I mean, just I, oftentimes the, the, the instinct in Washington is, is let's find the Washington solution. Is there a solution Washington should help emerge, should allow to emerge, which isn't Washington center at all to deal with, with these problems on the human capital side, on the, on the trust side, on the constitution writing side? I mean, let's think more globally about ways to, to have people who are interested in helping Egypt help Egypt. I'm open to any, any, any and all suggestions. The problem is every time the U.S. interferes, they screw up, and we end up in a bigger mess, you know. That's, I mean, if you want to call the Iraq war a success, you know, I mean, like, you go to war, you spend $200 billion, and you deliver the country to Iran. What a great result, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, that's just... Uh, so, uh, one, uh, one, one example. So, so I'm not so sure uh, that uh, we want uh, uh, the U.S. to interfere. I mean, I agree with uh, Mustafa. It's actually the only thing I agree with him about, uh, that uh, uh, we have to, as Egyptians, yeah, that uh, Egyptians have to sit down uh, together. Or what we're saying to the U.S. is, is okay because we need the support of the U.S. economically, and we need the IFC, and we need the, the international uh, assistance, and so on. What we're saying is this cannot be a, 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 an unconditional help. What we need to have is we help, because right now, contrary to what everybody thinks, I can tell you, and I'm a businessman, and I know my economy, and I know my country, there will not be any economic development in Egypt unless the political deadlock that exists now gets resolved. And when we are saying that, when we are saying that, we, we, you know, I can tell you that I'm, I'm in touch with, with the street, not with the political parties or my party and so on, because I, I'm a person who have always dealt with the young people, and I only believe in the young people, and I, I even don't go out at night except with half my age. You know, so. There are people who wouldn't brag about that. No, it's because I feel they, they have the future, they have the innocence, they're still not tinted, you know. It gives me a lot of energy, and that's the reason, you know. So, to tell you the truth, as I said in the beginning, the U.S. can only help us by saying, okay, guys, do you all believe in the Charta of the United Nations? Do you believe, you like our American Constitution? Because it's not an American Constitution. It's a constitution that would work out for anybody in the whole world. It would work for Russia. If Russia would take your constitution, we would have even better situations there. We would have a democratic Russia, okay, which we don't have today. So the motto of my speech should be like that. Yes, we need the help. Yes, we need the support, but not unconditional support. The support should be based that whoever is governing this country, liberals, Muslim brothers, they should, should adhere to the five principles in life. That they should real democracy, accepting the opposition, not harassing the opposition, accepting, believing in the private sector, believing in the women and their rights, believing in that minorities and Christians have the same rights and should be treated equally, you know, having a free media, not to be alienated by the media and trying to close down and crack down on the media. 
it's just the symptoms that you know very well. I don't know if this picture is here in the US or not, but all these five, six principles, there is zero of that in my country right now. I, I actually think um, two things. One is uh, it seems to me that the United States, after supporting Mubarak for um, his whole life, um, was- He trained uh, in the Soviet Union, you know. <laughs> but he was supported by, um, by the person. US. Yes. Um, the support of Mubarak after that, and, and the US was also um, taken by surprise by the Egyptian revolution. And um, I remember very well that w there was a, a banner in the last few days of the revolution uh, that, was, um, whole, uh, that was held by one uh, of our young people that was saying, Obama, we do not want to hate you. And I think that this banner was uh, telling volumes about what uh, Egyptians are expecting uh, from the United States in the coming uh, period. Uh, one of the interesting and important things that happened, and I think um, uh, um, is, is, uh, comes into this, is that the United States has now um, conditioned its economic assistance with the IMF um, loan. And I think that this is actually, the IMF is very unpopular in Egypt. And um, in my view, the, uh, any, any um, I, I am against uh, the, um, the, uh, the kind of um, austerity measures, uh, especially after what we have seen uh, in Greece um, lately. And I don't think that the U.S. Um, um, uh, position on this is, is, is helpful. But to tell you the truth, if you're asking uh, me personally, I would prefer that the United States assistance, economic assistance, would come through um, production projects um, and not through um, uh, loans or, um, or economic assistance. That's, that's number one. Number two, on the regional level, it seems to me that um, there is a chance now for, um, uh, for Egypt to get back on its feet regionally. And the last uh, 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 years of the Mubarak regime, when Egypt declined regionally, that, that opened the chance of a vacuum that was only filled by Iran. And it seems to me that the U.S. needs to realize that the independent Egypt, not the Xerox um, a copy positions of Egypt with the United States in the region, an independent Egypt is far more of interest to the United States because if Egypt has a regional power, um, this will be very beneficial to the United States if Egypt has different relations, diverse relations in the region that are not exactly the same as the United States as it was during Mubarak, then this will actually be very helpful to the United States in solving regional problems. Mustafa, is there, is there an international role that we should be looking for? not just the United States, but more broader? Exactly. I mean, um, I agree with uh, Dr. Manar that uh, the United States had to look at Egypt now from a different perspective. The aid programs and the, uh, the uh, economic assistance are not enough anymore. We are moving to a different economic reforms, and the U.S. has to change the model with Egypt. Private sector of uh, large blue ship companies and the states has to come into Egypt. New companies has to come into Egypt. We are a member of the American Chamber of Commerce, and every year we find the same companies, the same thing, the same words, the saying, where are the new companies? Where are the IT uh, blue ship companies? Where are the uh, Houston oil and gas companies? Where are the newcomers to come to Egypt? 
in a private sector model. We don't have to have it as a political economy. You need to support the, the, the current economy of the businessmen in Egypt and to help them and educate them. Remember, the economic reforms in Egypt are completely new. The Egyptian people need to be educated in order to fill this gap. And we don't have someone to help us in understanding these economic reforms. There's only one party now is taking care of it. What about the rest? So the U.S. could support technically. <laughs> Where is the red card? The red, ca the red, the red card is in our minds. <laughs> Khaled, you've made, you've made money as an entrepreneur. You've, you've incubated businesses. What's the role? And you said we spend too much time thinking about governments. What is the role of governments around the world to create the environment where we can have a less government-centered approach to Egypt? Yeah, let me just, uh, I, I think m most of the answers did not address the question, but I'll, I'll comment on them quickly and then come to your question. I think two observations. First of all, the non-military aid to Egypt from the U.S., from a commercial point of view, is very little. It's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, not a billion dollars. Uh, that is not going to make it or break it. That's sort of insignificant in an economy of any size, not to mention the size of Egypt. So to use it for or against with 100, 300, 400 million dollars, I think we're missing uh, the point. Second, a quick comment, the U.S. does not tell its private sector where to go or what to do. Intel, IBM, uh, um, any company chooses and selects where it wants to go, why it wants to go there, and these are the rules of the private sector. I'm proud to belong to it, and I know how it is. Now, coming to your question, is there any other player but the U.S. who is <coughs> playing a role, positively or negatively? And the answer is probably yes. Definitely Qatar is playing a role. Nobody can ignore that for whatever reason. Again, I'm not a politician. I don't understand the Qatari agenda. They may have one. They may be innocent, but they are playing a role. The fact that they are sending their, you know, injections to calm down the, the economic crisis is appreciated for sure, but at what price and for how long, it's not clear. It's sometimes not good to see somebody bleeding and just give him a narcotic you know, uh, or something to calm him down. Sometimes you need to face the problem and, and do the operation. And by sending just quick monies here and there without the scrutiny of an IMF or a World Bank, which has its own rules, I agree, it may not be very popular, but uh, guess what? Medicine sometimes is painful. And guess what? It, the pain today may be far less than the pain a year later. I mean, we've heard yesterday uh, from my friend Ayman about the Greek experience, how they missed the first pain, and now they are in the second pain, which is far more painful than the first one. And if Egypt waits longer, I think it's going to be more painful. So we want, from a commercial point of view, Egypt has far more relationship with Europe than with the U.S., believe it or not. The U.S. is not our biggest commercial partner compared to the EU, for instance. We have Italy, Spain, France, and Germany. I mean, much bigger trade partners from a commercial point of view. So the U.S. has its own military interest that remains, and nobody's debating that on all fronts. But the commercial aspect, I think, is very important. Europeans can play a role to help Egypt because it's Mediterranean, it's quasi-European because we're very close. If we fail, we'll export our uh, people to Italy and Spain, which is happening. People are taking trips and dying in the Mediterranean just to go and find jobs. That will increase further down the road if we have bad economy. This will have an impact on Europe. And I think Europe can play some role to answer your question. But Europe has its own problems today. I mean, it's uh, particularly our closest neighbors on the Mediterranean. We all ha know how it is, you know. So to ask them, Italy and Spain, to come and help us today is a little bit unfair. 
So that's why I don't think they will do something uh, very imminently. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn it to you. Um, if I could make three requests. First, that you, uh, you identify yourself when the microphone comes. Second, that you only ask one question uh, because there are a number of people I think who want to ask questions based on the hands I've seen creeping up whenever somebody finishes. I see the hands. And the third um, is that you ask your question in the form of a question, which is a genuine question with a genuine answer rather than a statement followed by what do you think of my statement. Um, the first question, this gentleman here has been very patient in the front. So, yes, sir. My name is Saad El Fishawi. I have been in the United States since 57 when I thought that Nasser was going to bring Egypt down the drain, and that's happening. And by, by the way, the thing that finally decided me to do that, because I was very actually successful lawyer in Egypt at the time, was reading Animal Farm. I don't know how many people know about that. So very quickly, things I heard I heard and cannot believe my ears. One of them saying that America does not necessarily have a principle which religion does not, does not have any interference with politics. They do. And even a prayer in the public schools is prohibited. Any prayer. So that was not. Another thing I understand either by training or by, by, by being that person inclination, people can, fee, can be very optimistic. Because here I heard the optimistic point that economy can, self, self, can save and salvage Egypt from the problems it has now. That cannot happen because humans don't live by Bread alone. Okay, we, we need to come to the question. Yeah. Well, also, whether America is interfering or not, every country in the world, by definition, its public relations, its international relationships is built on one principle, the interest of that country. Is, is, there, a sorry, is there a question, does not, sir? does not know where its interest, and actually the first speaker was absolutely right lack of information. President Obama the other day with the suspects says these young people are American the way they live. American, they will the act. He does not know the fact that by, by, by the definition of Muslim brothers, okay. they do not have allegiance to any country. Their aim is to have one big country of all people. Okay, okay. Mr. Fashawi, true or not, that violates the rule. <laughs> that, that violates the rule of not making a statement and saying, what do you think of my statement? So we're going to go to another question right there, sir, in the white shirt. Yes, sir. My name is Amin Mahmoud. I'm with the American-Egyptian Strategic Alliance, which is a lobby company, uh, organization. Uh, my question is, uh, is the president of Egypt responsible with the opposition to negotiate together? And the shame on them all, both of them who don't have a leadership, if they don't sit down and talk to each other to solve the problem of Egypt. We have enough people with a brain not to refuse to talk to each other. And I'm supporting the young opinion, not to say anything about the other people, but but you guys will, will lead the way to success Egypt. Thank I'm afraid I've gone 0 for 2. <laughs> I must say that, that for me this is a record because all the time I've ever laid out that rule, I've never had a problem like this. <laughs> but Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain, I can trust to keep, to keep with the rules. Boy, I sure hope so now. Uh, uh, I, I, do ha I do have a question. Um, uh, I do have a question. Uh, we haven't really talked about the judiciary. Um, and when we look at the what appears to us uh, clear across the Atlantic 
as a crackdown on the judiciary, and we see the crackdown on certain businessmen, and we see um, the crackdown on the free media, there appears to be a pattern of uh, intimidation to uh, people who have different views. So I'd like, I would like the, to have a little bit of a discussion on the judiciary, uh, business, and the free media. Mr. Suedo owns a television that's station. Uh, I'm sure he has sure, views. That's my favorite question. <laughs> I think uh, even people would think I told you to ask this. Let me tell you the disaster of the juridical system in Egypt now that we are suffering. I'll forget about the media and everything. That's really like the easy stuff. But we changed our constitution. We changed one element in the constitution to kick a lady judge because she was too liberal and too forceful in defending uh, human rights. So we reduced the, the upper constitutional court to 11 people just to eliminate this troublesome lady. So that was the first step. So we made a constitution that w totally was done by one party only, not representing the whole society. So our constitution today is practically illegal. I mean, if in any court of law and internationally, this constitution would fail the first test. Then we went out and we surrounded, the, the constitutional court was surrounded to prevent the judges of the constitutional court to rule on, on the legitimacy of the, the parliament and the uh, Shura Council. So they couldn't go to their court to oversee the case. And then when we were not done with all that, we came with the exceptional uh, declaration of the president where he gave his, his the rights of God and uh, uh, ended up you know, with a, removing a general uh, attorney against the law and putting uh, a, general, a new general attorney again, totally in uh, disrespect to the Egyptian laws. So he's an unlawful general attorney we have now. The court has recently ruled that he's unlawful there, and he's still there. He doesn't want to leave. Then we ended up when this was not enough, because the courts were overruling all the actions of the government and the governing board. Now they went out the, with, a, with, a, with a demonstration Again, at the High Council of, of, of Judges in order to what they call we want to clear the juridical system from these rotten judges, you know. So, because we want judges that will rule according to our request and our wishes, you know. So, that's the disaster uh, of the juridical system, you know. I will not prolong more because if I told you again about the media and so on, it would be too long. Yeah, sure. I'll give you a slight different view on this, and uh, it's a result of the last three days talking to all parties and so on, and again, I'm lucky not to belong to anyone. Uh, underlying problem for this is, is trust, lack of trust. If you listen to Muslim Brotherhood and you read between the lines, they are scared to death. They are scared of the past. Some of these judges have put them into prison. <coughs> And many of the leadership of Muslim Brotherhood have seen prison, not just once, but more than once. We, none of us, I don't think, none of the liberals, none of the Egyptians, nobody was supportive of the type of, uh, you know, uh, judges or things that happened in the past, including people being put in prison without a fair justice. But that is a lingering thing that keeps them trying to, you know, do things one way or the other to prevent that past from coming back. They call them fulul in Egypt. Fulul is a word that stands for the past now. People who belong to Mubarak, people who would like to support Mubarak's regime coming back, the judiciary who belong to Mubarak's regime, but probably 90% of that is not accurate or true it's just that fear and lack of trust that's driving that line of thought. They are scared, they are acting as if they are a minority, as if it's the past and they are afraid of everybody else, including the opposition, the judiciary, the old regime. They are just not behaving like people in charge. And this is a fundamental problem. And that lack of trust on all sides is the underlying problem in my interpretation. 
Um, I just um, uh, would like to uh, say two things on um, uh, as uh, on this point of the judiciary. One of them is because I was um, in the Constitutional Assembly and I attended the um, the. Uh, I was in the leadership uh, also, so I attended ev all the meetings. When we were talking about the judiciary, and I'm a woman, and I would, would have never agreed, you know, if it's deliberately against the Hani Gibeli. This, this actually is a, a very um, popular uh, story that never happened. What happened actually was that when we were talking about the Supreme Court, there were a lot of constitutional law professors and judges who were in the meetings um, about how to re or how to invent or how to look at how our Supreme Court is going to look like. And many of them, some of them are from liberal parties, including the West Party, said that 19 members is a lot. And they wanted to reduce that number, and they had very um, reasonable, um, you know, uh, arguments to make on why this is not this is a too 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 big of a number. And some of them uh, actually proposed that the number would be nine, like the American Supreme Court. But others were a little uh, concerned that the number would be, you know, from 19 to 9, it's so said, let's make that 11. And all of the other people agreed, and none of the people on this table knew whether, that Tahani Gibeli was number 12 or number 11. I mean, so, uh, so this was totally, totally uh, one of the, uh, stories that people kept repeating and have no basis whatsoever, just as many stories um, that were said about the Constitutional Assembly. Now, the other point and that I really disagree, as a, and, and many of, the, uh, of my colleagues here know that I'm, I'm an independent person, I, am, I cherish my independence, I'm not part of any political party, and obviously I'm not a Muslim brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was one of the people who protested in Tahrir Square and asked for the prosecutor general of Mubarak to be kicked out because he's corrupt. He was um, appointed by Mubarak. And it wasn't just me. We were a lot of people who asked for this. This was one of the demands of the revolution from day one. Now, when we made this uh, demand, we knew that the prosecutor general cannot be fired. We knew that. And we still said that we want this guy to be, be kicked out, which means that we were not counting on the Constitution or the law. This was a revolutionary demand. And that's why I was so puzzled and mystified when some of my friends and colleagues who were with me during these protests calling for the kicking out of this guy when the president kicked him out, they were like, oh, no, this is, this is really against the judiciary. I, I, just, I just am puzzled and mystified and don't understand because According to the law and constitution, he cannot be fired. Yes. But we in Tahrir Square knew that, and we still were asking for his kicking out. This was a, a demand right from the days of SCAF, and SCAF didn't do it. That's only what I wanted to say on this point. And that has nothing to do with the appointment of the new one. I'm talking especially about the, 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 the firing of that uh, prosecutor general. Okay, I will solve your puzzle, you know. I don't know why you are puzzled. <laughs> it's not a matter of who is the general prosecutor. It's a matter of respecting the law. 
If the president wants to remove a corrupt or a general like you call him, Mubarak, or it's a revolution, if we start neglecting our own laws and not adhering to, and we give the president that right, that he does not, he's not accountable to our law, it's a very dangerous situation. So, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. So what you miss completely is that this man was fired illegally and the new one was appointed illegally. And this way we are giving him a free hand to, to neglect our laws. And once a president is not accountable to his own country's law and constitution, it's the end of that nation. I saw a lady right here in black. Uh, hi, I'm Noah. Oops, sorry, uh, Noah George. I'm an Egyptian American. Um, I live here in D.C. But I want to go back to how this whole revolution started with the younger generation, and you really don't hear so like they go into Tahrir Square. You see the pictures and all that stuff. But moving forward, is there a role for them still to shape? this and, and, and would be the new Egypt, or has this been completely hijacked? Well, so far it's been hijacked, but they are resisting. I see them, I work with them, and they are not letting go this time, I assure you. I work with the young, and I meet with them all the time, and I hear also news f uh, about the young within po political parties revolting. I would love to see the young kicking out everybody else and, and taking it in their own hands in all parties because they will be negotiating without legacies. They will be converging easier than what we're experiencing today. Whether they will succeed short term, I'm not sure, but the young will succeed because we have a population that's extremely young. I was just giving the example yesterday that the people in charge in Egypt, most of them, 90% in high-level positions, they are men above 60, right? That's 3% of the Egyptian population. While below 40, we have 80% of the population. So it's a very skewed, unfair distribution. And anything that's skewed and unfair does not last too long. To this, um, thank you very much, Noha, for asking this question because it's actually the core of what is going to happen, in my view. And I think that the 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 next uh, struggle in Egypt is going to be generational, and you might be watching out for that because. Um, the fatal mistake that the younger generation that triggered the revolution did was um, that they deferred after the toppling of Mubarak, they deferred to the older generations, which actually went back to politics as usual, going back to their polarization and all of that. Now, the young generation has become sick and tired of all the political elite. It's not just that they are um, uh, you know, upset with the Muslim brothers, but they are upset with their own parties as well as with, the, with their own political trends. And there are more than one party that has um, uh, a generational uh, conflict and uh, revolt from the, 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 the young. So this is, the, the, this is, in my view, what is uh, going to happen. And actually, this will be very positive to happen because I think that it's, it's now time for this generation to start ruling Egypt. This, the, the whole political elite in Egypt has proved um, uh, to be inept. I think the young generation uh, 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 participation in the uh, revolution is never hijacked, ever. I think they are trapped between the political parties fighting for the chair, fighting for the politics. They don't know where to go. They're trying to find their way. I've seen many people, they have energy, they are aggressive, they want to do something. And uh, I believe once things are stable, we will see the young generation are participating more aggressively in the politics and the economics of Egypt. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm getting to the point 
where people are starting to get very aggressive waving hands. I see the hands. We're not going to have time to get everybody. But there's a woman in the back who I'm afraid is going to fall off her chair if I don't call on her. So why don't we go there, and then we'll see if we can get another question in. Um, actually, I didn't want to ask anybody something, but I want to, to go deep inside Mr. Mustafa. Right, if, 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 because there are people who have questions. No, honestly, because we had the problem at the beginning. There, People do have questions. Okay. Uh, it's a question, actually. I'm Julia Milad. I'm That's a membership I, yeah. from like, most of movement in Egypt before the revolution. And when he explained our community in Egypt and when he talked about Egyptian people, all of you talk about how we can live together. And when he said, my best, my neighbor is a uh, Christian, and my ex-girlfriend, she's Christian, and my good friend, she is, he's Salafis. And he didn't talk about another Muslim. He's not Salafi, and he's not Muslim Brotherhood. And he put like Christian in two parts. I don't like it anymore to put it in it when he said he's my neighbor and my ex-girlfriend and he talked about businessmen and I want to mention that and how America can help Egypt, how businessmen in America can help Egypt. I want to ask you what about business, Egyptian businessmen? What's happened with Muslim Brotherhood? What's happened to this guy? So, are there, so, so if I understand the question, the question is are there opportunities for people in business who are not close to the Brotherhood. Is that, is that accurate? It's a yes or no? No. I really don't understand the question. I mean, you mean, I, I don't understand. You mean, the, who, you mean the view from the Egyptian businessman? What do you mean? I really didn't understand your question. Uh, Ibrahim Owais, Professor Emeritus from Georgetown University. I have two questions. All right, one question. The, the question is, uh, are Muslim brothers planting the seeds of their own destruction? Who would like to take that? Yes. And big no. I'm sorry, I say no as well. <laughs> this gentleman in the front row will get the last question on this round. Thank you very much. Ahmed Fathi, Alwav News, uh, correspondent of the United Nations, a little bit steer away from foreign policy and I'll stick to the economy as most of the members of the panel uh, have a business background. Uh, how do you expect with the rise of a fascist uh, regime as the Muslim Brotherhood that the policies of the free market are going to change and the continuation of the crony capitalist system that existed during Mubarak will forego uh, I will uh, borrow a quote uh, from a former uh, Muslim Brotherhood girlfriend I had. She's retiring happily in Amsterdam. <laughs> that uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood have mastered the art of uh, saying what they don't mean and act without giving a prior uh, notice. Thank you very much. I, I have no comment in this, to be honest. No. I'm not willing to jeopardize the efforts of the Muslim Brotherhood. I believe where I owe them a great respect because I've seen them, how they work hard. I've seen the president, how he's flying every country, not sleeping for 24 hours, continuously trying to work hard for the, for the economy. Well, if you're used to this question, and there is a bedroom here as well in this hotel. Look, I want to be fair um, first. I mean. Uh, everybody, you know, the Muslim Brothers took over the country. The country was not in its best of shape. Anybody who would have taken this country at the, at the time they took it would have been faced with the same with problems and even more. If you want to know the general problems we have, 
One of the biggest problems we have on the economy is that the, the socialists or the labor unions or all the labor in Egypt thought that this revolution is going to bring them money on a tray. And it's going to make them all become rich and that they don't need to work as much and like a total. Then we had the dissolution of the security was before the Muslim Brotherhood came. So it was not like when they came, it became uh, that bad. I always get attacked when I say that our economic program of the Free Egyptian Party that I was an initiator for actually is identical with the Muslim Brotherhood's economic program. So we don't have in our party a, 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 a problem about that. I also be, that's why also I always reach out to the governing body and say, you need to understand that this is not just your country, it's all of us, our countries, and we can can only be built if we all put our hands together and built it. And I'm repeating that every uh, single time. So to, 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 talk, uh, to, to, to be honest, everything the Muslim Brotherhood been trying to do if in the economical side, you know, or the principles they're trying to you know, I, am, I can criticize some of the, like the government we have now is weak, and some of the, the choices of the ministers are not the best, and so on. But the program, because, you know, because Islam is actually a religion that encourages business and trade. You know, it's one of the most practical, let's say, religions when it comes to that. And therefore, personally, I am not at all against, I haven't seen any economical step that they were trying to do, you know, except that, of course, uh, we have the same symptoms like mo during Mubarak. So some of the organs of the economic system, like the regulator of the stock exchange is politicized, like the, some ministers are politicized, so it means some decisions are being taken for political, from political angles. But in general, the problems the Muslim Brotherhoods are facing would have been faced by anyone who had had to come and rule. And, and the, the program they are trying to uh, uh, encourage would have, is not a program that I have a lot of criticism to. Uh, I don't see also, I agree with Naguib, uh, any ideological problem uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, with a free economy, but I see a lack of experience. And the economy is driven by many elements, not just one. And the Muslim Brotherhood's experience in driving an economy is not there. Let's face it, I think they admit that as well. They have not run a country before, and they don't know the elements the service industry, the, the, the manufacturing industry, all of that, they know a little bit of the trade industry, which is a small or a, a component of the economy. The rest, tourism, for instance, which is a big driver for foreign currency in Egypt, services, in t information technology, which is a sector I fully understand and, and I, I appreciate that it's a big potential for Egypt. All of that is, is very, very new to them. The previous regime has come to some grip to understand these elements. Nobody should deny that. I was not pro that regime. I stood in Tahrir Square against it. But we have to learn how to be very objective. And there were elements in the economy before the revolution that were growing relatively well. There was a big element of corruption that prevented that economic growth from trickling down to the poor. But that problem remains. So we need to find a solution for the real problem, not invent new problems and try to solve them. That's the problem. I, uh, one of the things that um, I always um, appreciated about Mr. Sawiris, who is Christian, is his objectivity and the way he talks about issues from different angles. Actually, um, I am not comfortable and I do not like the way um, um, the language that was used sometimes in this room about the Muslim brothers because uh, this language is actually a manifestation of what's going on, what's wrong with Egypt at this moment. This is a part of the um, politics of exclusion that is going on and um, guess what? The Muslim brothers are not going to leave Egypt. They won the elections. I didn't vote for them, but they won the elections. I have to take my hat for them. 
if I'm really a Democrat. Some people claim to be liberal and Democrat, and then when it comes to uh, the Muslim brothers, uh, they, they use very, um, um, uh, very ex exclusionary uh, language that uh, I think is unacceptable in a democratic society. Um, we, have, we have come to the end of this, this panel. I apologize to the many people who are here. The, 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 the positive note of this is there's another panel yet to come. Uh, we'll take a 15-minute break. Uh, the restrooms are out to that side. We have some refreshments. We'll come back. Please join me in thanking the panel. Yeah.